welcome to Health Live at Seniors today. We are here right in the middle of the festival season. So if you hear some band baja at the background, please excuse me. We have here with us uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep Puri, uh, all the way from Ludhiana. Of course, on cyberspace, it's not really on the way. It's very much here. Uh, uh, a little about Dr. Puri. Uh, he did his MBBS and MD in medicine from Dayanand Medical College and Hospital and joined the faculty uh, way back in 1992. He's held various positions at DMC, head of the medicine department, medical superintendent, uh, principal and dean of, of the college, a position he's been holding for the last six years. He's also chairman, board of studies in medical studies, uh, postgraduate at the Baba Farid University of Health Sciences in Farid Court. Uh, Dr. Puri was awarded the fellowship by the Indian College of Physicians, Indian Academy of Clinical Medicine, International Medical Science Academy and membership of the National Academy for Medical Sciences. He's also trained in rheumatology at the Ames in New Delhi in 2002. He has supervised 35 theses, participated in seven multina multinational clinical trials and published uh, over 50 articles in various journals and chapters and books. Uh, his service to the community has been by donating blood 93 times and this is also to encourage the movement of uh, blood donation. Uh, welcome to Health Live at Seniors Today, uh, Dr. Puri. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Prabhu Manji. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, organization in this talk today. So, so tell me, Doctor, you, you've uh, you know, supervised uh, so many pieces. You've done a fair, fair bit of research work, etc. Uh, how... What, what is the balance like between research and, and, and practical, uh, uh, you know, practicing of, of, of medicine? Yeah, I think it's a very, very valid uh, question and an important one. I remember one uh, speaker who'd come here a few years back. He's a renowned uh, person internationally. When he talked about the doctors of uh, the duties of a doctor, he said a doctor can perform three things. One is that uh, he can teach medicine. Two, he can see his patients in a good, proper manner. And third, he can do research. So if as a doctor, you can accomplish and do one of these things in your life in a proper manner, I think you've done your duty. So doing all these three things together is a challenge. But I think uh, God gives us blessings, the strength and the energy to do all these things. And uh, well, so far, I've held ground and I've been able to do a bit in all these things. And I hope I can continue the same way. And what is the COVID scene um, uh, in, in Ludhiana, in that part of the country, in Punjab? As such, we've been hearing a lot of stories that things were not all that uh, great. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we are now seeing the scare that uh, you saw in Mumbai a couple of months back. Uh, there must still be so many cases occurring there, but the scare must have settled down. But we have gone into that scare mode right now in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we at uh, DMC, where I'm working and where I'm the principal, we are a 1,600-bedded facility. And because of this COVID thing all over Punjab, uh, we probably the hospital in North India, which is looking after the most patients. And at present, we've got close to 300 COVID patients right here in our hospital. So the number of cases are going up. Punjab initially was seeing a few cases. Now they're seeing close to 1,500, 1,700 cases per day. And we're touching a mortality of around 35, 40 per day for a state of uh, three crore population. I think that's a large number. So we're right now going through that scary phase. Yeah, it is indeed very worrying. Uh, you know, some of us who are in the metros uh, have been experiencing it uh, a fair bit despite the fact that we have some of the best of uh, medical facilities. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's move on to uh, uh, the, the session today. We are indeed, as I mentioned earlier, delighted to have you here with us uh, to speak about hypertension and uh, other uh, uh, issues concerning health of senior citizens. Uh, we have a large number of people who have gathered here to listen in to you. We have a few questions. Uh, uh, I'll take one from uh, Deepak Desai. Uh, well, it's actually from Kamini Desai, or Kamini. 
My age is 62, uh, female. While climbing the staircase, I feel tired and fast breathing. Uh, experience fast breathing. Is there a remedy to reduce or cure? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, whenever you have any kind of a symptom, we have to find out what the cause for it is, right? And at the age of 62, apart from what the things that you talked, uh, uh, the first and foremost thing that I would like to rule out is what is your hemoglobin level? Because these symptoms, the tiredness that you're feeling, the palpitations or the increased heartbeat that you're feeling, which is affecting on exertion, the first thing that one would like to rule out is what your HP hemoglobin levels are, if you're anemic. Uh, second, what is your normal level of exercise? Are you leading a very sedentary lifestyle or are you very active? You go for your routine walks, you do some kind of a yoga, all these things. If you've been doing that and you've started feeling these symptoms now, you definitely need to get yourself checked up. Apart from a low hemoglobin, yes, you would look for any kind of a high blood pressure that may be there. Uh, everything is treatable, but it would depend upon what exactly the reason is. If low HP is the cause, just correcting your hemoglobin is going to make you feel perfectly fine. Thank you. We have a question from Dosta Karya. It says, when should one go for the ambulatory BP test? Okay, that's a nice question. Uh, ambulatory BP monitoring is something like you have a machine which is put onto you and it continuously monitors your blood pressure at frequent intervals every 15 minutes or so. So you have that machine on onto your body for 24 hours and thereafter it gives you the reading. Now there are some people who tend to have a very labile hypertension. They would come to you that yes, my blood pressure just shoots up and then it suddenly drops. Uh, some people are taking medications, they're going to their doctors and the doctor would find that his BP in the morning is 180 by 100 and in the evening it drops to 90 by 70. Then there's a third set of uh, people who might be suffering from a particular disease. We've got a disease called a pheochromocytoma, that is of the adrenals, which produces wide fluctuations of BP. So if on your routine monitoring of blood pressure, supposing you're monitoring it twice or thrice a day, you do it in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And over the period of three, four days, you find that there are wide fluctuations into it. That's the time when you would like to do an ambulatory BP monitoring. Secondly, there are people who come into your clinic and we call it as a white coat hypertension. They enter the clinic and their blood pressure kind of shoots up. But they say that while they're at home, your blood pressure readings are more or less normal. Uh, these patients, again, uh, they might need an ambulatory BP monitoring, which would confirm whether their baseline pressures are normal. So primarily, wherever there are wide fluctuations, or if you've got a high blood pressure that is not being controlled optimally by using quite a few drugs, then your doctor might want you to do an ambulatory monitoring. Uh, we have a question from Purnima Kiroskar, who says, my, my mother is 57, since this COVID-19 situation has started on various occasions, her BP shoots up abruptly. Is it a kind of a heart-related situation? Is there any particular eating habit that she needs to follow? Uh, as per the doctor, we have reduced her salt and sugar intake. She follows her medication properly. Please uh, advise. Yeah, I think uh, diet, as we said, is the uh, cornerstone. I mean, You'll have to be kind of careful at times if your doctor has prescribed diuretics and this weather is a humid weather in which you tend to sweat. Some people, they tend to get low sodium levels. So you have to be careful as to how much of salt restriction that you're doing. Do not make salt zero into her diet. A normal person requires around five grams of salt. So bring it down to something like say four grams of salt per day which should be adequate. The rest of the uh, BP should be taken care of by other uh, measures like uh, walking and uh, taking ample fruits and uh, then of course your medications. I don't see it as a matter of great concern, but if there are some fluctuations, I mean, uh, be sure that she's not stressed up. I mean, COVID has been a stressful situation. We don't have uh, definitions of COVID depression coming in right now, but I'm very sure in the next few months and years, 
we will have uh, people, uh, psychiatrists, living that uh, anxiety and stress definitely has built up in and the, uh, the COVID times, and it is contributing towards fluctuant and high blood pressures. But yes, uh, if there are wide fluctuations, uh, preferably uh, examination should be conducted. But uh, at home, what you can do is monitor her BP, make sure she's taking the medicines at a regular time, make sure what she's following in the diet and she's kind of avoiding all these high salt intake foods, the pickles and poppers and charts that we tend to at times consume. Because a lot of people have been into cooking these times and we've got the people who've developed a passion for cooking and I'm sure she must be a good cook and if she is uh, treating herself to some more delicacies, that could be one reason for it. That's just on the lighter side. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, you know, what is your view about, you, you mentioned about the salt intake which is there now. There are a host of things which you get uh, in, uh, in, in shops, whether they are, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the salted uh, namkeens as, they, as, as they're called, which wafers or, or whatever else, which have a huge salt intake. So how much should one have of, 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 of those uh, uh, products? Again, I mean, uh, if you go by what I just quoted in one of my slides, the salt five intake minutes. should be five grams per day, right? A five grams would be one level, level teaspoonful, not a tablespoonful, a teaspoonful of salt, which you're going to take in the entire day, whether it's in your uh, vegetables that you cook, whether it's in the snacks that you eat or anything like that. Now, these are all concealed salts, right? You put it over your salads. You have a pickle along with the, when you're eating your food, you've got that uh, nice sleazy papad over there. And if you're sipping that uh, hot cup of tea in the evening, you tend to have uh, these beautiful namkeens which are available. But let me tell you, all of them contribute to an increased salt intake. And that is where one has to put the, line, you have to restrict that salt intake if you're hypertensive. And if you're uncontrolled, it's even more important to look at these things because when you talk about uncontrolled, there are people who would be taking three or four pills of blood, high blood pressure and still their blood pressure is not controlled. So the common things, if they're taking anti-allergic medication, if they're taking painkillers, and third, of course, is when we do a recce about the diet that they're taking, and it'll come through that they're taking actually some things which are rich in salt and is contributing to your high blood pressure. Thank you. We have a question from Anand K. who says, my blood pressure is under control, 110 by 70, with half telma, EMOD. I have reduced my weight by 6 kgs. Uh, can I stop my medication? Or how do we decide when to stop my medication? Any precautions I need to take? Well, the ideal blood pressure is if it's less than 120 by 80, then we have to see what are your risk factors like. Did your parents or your siblings, did they have any kind of a premature uh, heart disease? When I say premature, if a male member less than 60 years of age or a female member less than 55 years of age in his lifetime has had a heart attack, it's considered as a premature. It's considered as a strong family history. So if either one of your parents or your siblings has had a heart problem at less than these age groups, then your family history is strong. What are your lipid parameters like? I'm sure if you're a hypertensive, your doctor must have gotten your uh, lipid parameters done. If they're not kind of very offensive, very bad, and if they're managed and if they're controlled, I would like to maintain your blood pressure at 120 by 80 or lower than that, 110 by 70 is perfect. You can, because tell my M is a combination of two salts. It's got tell me sartan 40 mg and amlodip in 5 mg. So you're taking half of that tablet. So virtually what you're taking is 20 mg of tell me sartan and 2.5 mg of amlodip. So you can possibly switch on to a single dose that is tell me sartan 20 and see if your blood pressure, but if it kind of shoots up, if it is going beyond 120, then it'll be better that if you just continue with it. Uh, these medicines are not going to harm you in the long run. Okay, uh, thank you. We have a question from uh, Sangeeta Kedia who says, is common salt or rock salt? What would you advise? 
Well, uh, there are some studies which quote that rock salt is a shade better than the common salt. But if uh, so, in medicine, what we talk about is evidence based medicine. The two types of medicine which are practiced now one is evidence based medicine, one is precision based medicine. So, over these years, as we live, uh, precision made medicine would uh, take over. But what do you mean by evidence? Evidence means that uh, you show it, you give 1,000 people common salt and you give rock salt to 1,000 people and you prove those benefits. That is how one can say that this one is superior to or this one is not inferior to A versus B. So as of now, there is no I mean, final diction that we tell our patients that, okay, you should take rock salt or something. Companies do promote it. There are a lot of ads which come onto the TV. Uh, they are uske piche bol that ki bhi doctor ki se pramanit or something like that those kind of figures are there but uh, i seriously believe that we need evidence so there are some people who say that rock salt is a shade better than common salt but both of them the lesser the better it is doctor as an aside i must ask you your your uh, when i was reading information about your about yourself I, I, I noted that you have participated in clinical trials. Right. So you've been hearing a lot about clinical trials uh, uh, happening with the vaccine in Russia and uh, the Indian vaccine that is, that is going to be there. So could you throw some light on what, what is the process of clinical trials and since you've been part of uh, many of them? Yeah, so I mean, clinical trials, they go through various phases, right? You have a phase one clinical trial, then you have a phase two, then you have a phase three. So the initial phases of any new molecule, any new drug which is being tested, it's usually carried out in animals. Subsequently, once they find out that these things are safe, then they come on to human trials. So the initial trials, which are phase two trials, when they're carried out in humans, they have a very robust kind of an infrastructure to back them up. So their profile of how to use the drug, what effects to note, what side effects to note, the compensation that they would offer to people who willingly participate. It's a very strong and robust system. I mean, we've read negative things about uh, clinical trials, uh, that uh, the trials, uh, the compensation which is given that Western companies have come into India and they conduct trials. Let me tell you, there are equal number of subjects. They know their rights and they participate in the clinical trials in the true manner. Most trials in India are usually done in the phase three. So phase three is where a molecule has been found to be relatively safe in human trials. And now they're doing it on a larger population subgroup. And then they're seeing as to whether this is kind of efficacious. The uh, dictum in medicine is first do no harm. So whatever you're going to do, whether it gives you a benefit or an advantage, that's secondary. First of all, it should not do you any harm. So whenever these clinical trials are done, so the details are so significant and so elaborate. In the trials that we used to do, I mean, if I have to do a particular trial in one patient, it will take me at least, say, about 60, 70 hours of input uh, about catching all the details, maintaining uh, all the data, feeding it into it, and subsequently they kind of analyze these details. So as far as the vaccine is going, yes, because it's something uh, very rare, it's about after 100 years that such a pandemic has occurred that has brought this world to a standstill. Uh, the people are in a hurry, so they are kind of uh, pushing these phase one, two, and three a little more quicker and hoping that uh, it would come through. But yes, the system of conducting a clinical trial, it's absolutely robust. And if it is followed properly, uh, there is no chance. I mean, they would terminate a trial early if you found that this medicine is not benefiting. And then you would terminate this trial. If you're comparing two medicines and you find that A medicine is benefiting the patients much more than the B medicine, they would terminate that trial. They would say, that once there's so much of benefit coming from one, there's no need to try the next one. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, there are several questions that have come in. I think I must not digress uh, uh, here. There's a question from Katie, Katie Dadanchi. She says, Doctor, the minute I enter, the, enter a doctor's clinic, my BP shoots up with palpitations. And once I'm at home, it comes back to normal. What should I do? 
I'm 69. Yeah. Is there any medicine to control this? Yeah, I think I just mentioned in the short presentation that I heard earlier. So that's what we call as the white coat hypertension. Not that all um, doctors do wear white coats in their chambers in their clinics today. In our hospital, we do tend to wear those white coats. So that's the term given, the white coat hypertension. And uh, well, it does happen with so many of my uh, patients that uh, I take their blood pressure. It's so high. They'll say that whenever I'm at home, uh, my blood pressure is absolutely normal. So I do respond, okay, I'm not that scary and uh, I can joke with you, so you don't need to be scared. But uh, I guess it's a natural thing and it's recognized. It's a medical term which has been given, that is white coat hypertension. Uh, we'll give importance to your blood pressure readings at home. If those readings are normal, then you need not go by the figures that are recorded in the uh, doctor's chamber. Go by the figures which are there and your doctor will tell you that please take your figures and bring those readings to me. I'm going to treat you according to that. Uh, we have a question from uh, Uchi Ram Sarma Rampali. I'm sorry, I don't get your pronunci the pronunciation of your name right every week. Uh, he says, I'm 71, male, healthy, physically active, eat cooked food once a day with fruits, diet at night. I was showing slightly higher BP earlier sometimes, was prescribed a tablet, took it three years before I switched to a single meal and fruits. I have a feeling that my BP is normal. How to be sure I was not... I was asked not to stop medication. Well, uh, I think uh, the only figure is your blood pressure reading. We do get people who adopt a very stringent and a uh, very strict kind of a lifestyle. It does lower their blood pressure. So the optimal thing is what your blood pressure readings are. If you've stopped your medications and your blood pressure is normal, if it's not going beyond 130 by 85, that's what I would suggest. Beyond 130 or 85 is something which I would like to treat. Then uh, you need to be, you're safe. You don't need to think that I was on medicines and how I've stopped it. It does occur. It does occur in quite a few people that they, once they adopt a very good and a healthy lifestyle uh, compared to what it was earlier, their BB medications get stopped. Thank you. We have a question uh, from uh, Devendra Gada who says, my question is, is blood pressure related to any organ or anything else? Uh, very relevant question. I'm in uh, hypertension. So first of all, I mean, whenever a person walks in, I tell him that you've got hypertension. So you have to uh, distinguish anxiety and uh, mental agony and stress from hypertension. So hypertension essentially is high blood pressure. And we classify it into two types. One is a primary and a secondary. A primary or essential or idiopathic, these are terms which we interchangeably use. That's the blood pressure, high blood pressure in more than 90% of these subjects. 10% of people would tend to have something what we call as a secondary hypertension. So secondary hypertension means that your blood pressure has gone up because of some disease within your body. There are some people in whom their blood vessels, they kind of become very tight. There's some kind of a vasculitis. There are some people in whom their renal blood vessels, the arteries which supply the kidneys, they kind of get narrowed down. So that is known as renovascular hypertension. There are some people in whom there is uh, increased secretion of steroids from within. Right? You all notice that uh, people say that steroids are not side effects. Hote well, our body itself secretes steroids. It's essential for our body to maintain them. If they're low, also we can be diseased. So if you've got excess of steroids in your body, which we call as a Cushing syndrome, that also can produce uh, secondary hypertension. So one of the causes in which you're taking medications and your blood pressure is not getting control makes us suspicious to, you know, look for causes of secondary hypertension. Then in very young people, people less than the age of 25, if they get a high blood pressure, we always look for these causes because they are potentially uh, treatable. I mean, you might treat that renovascular hypertension, dilate that uh, artery of kidneys, which is constricted, and you may not need to take any medications. So you're right that 90% of people have 
idiopathic, that is something, the cause of which is not known, but 10% of people would have a secondary hypertension. And uh, there is a host of causes. I've just enumerated three or four of them, but there are at least about 15, 20 other causes which can be responsible for high blood pressure. The first question is from Puneet Vengankar, who says, Doctor, I'm 72 years old, fit and fine, had an angioplasty in 2009, first and maybe last. Being a sports sports person, had managed my activity in spite of huge financial breakdowns. Which test or follow-up checkup should I do? Is an angiography needed? Uh, well, I am sure that your cardiologist must be doing a routine checkup, whether it's at, uh, an annual affair or he does it every two years. So there are some basic parameters in your blood tests and all that you need to go through. If you're doing a good bit of physical exercise and if you're not getting any symptoms, symptoms like chest pain, symptoms like getting out of breath, symptoms like sweating, which could indicate angina, well, I presume that you're doing fine. Uh, you need not go in for an angiography. Uh, you can actually uh, get some other investigations uh, also done, which are sort of an angiographies, of course, are of two types. Uh, you know, there's a CT angiography, which is done. And then uh, there is a, a normal routine kind of a coronary angiography done. But uh, for this kind of a thing, uh, myocardial perfusion scans are also done, which are equally, I mean, they're not as cumbersome as uh, an angiography is. So you can get the perfusion scan done, which your doctor would advise. And uh, if you do it now, and if you're asymptomatic, you need to repeat it maybe after five years. Or your doctor might just say you get a treadmill test done, because that would also give you a fairly good idea how your uh, coronary muscle, uh, heart muscles are doing. Uh, thank you, doctor, for all the responses on uh, hypertension. We have a, a, a general question that has come in from uh, Nilam Sethi, which is uh, uh, of interest to a lot of people, I guess. Why are we facing a lot of hair fall these days? Hair fall. <laughs> yeah, that is one of the things that I mentioned uh, in the uh, 50s. That is one of uh, major concern. And uh, now that there are so many hair transplant centers which have come up and they're doing thriving business. So all those people who say but uh, yes, that is a concern. Uh, I guess, I mean, uh, hair fall is linked to quite a few things. It can be linked to your lifestyle. It can be linked to your food habits. Uh, there are some particular vitamins, particularly biotin which is helpful in maintaining the growth of your hair. So if you're deficient in biotin, uh, now don't ask me what are the sources of biotin because there are not too many sources of biotin. I mean, if you're eating a good, healthy, balanced diet, that would work. There are theories that uh, deficiencies of calcium and vitamin D also can contribute to uh, this kind of a hair fall. So all that I can uh, tell you is that uh, have less of stress, uh, drink ample amount of uh, liquids and water in your day. Uh, consume a diet which has got uh, ample amount of uh, all these vitamins and trace elements. So kind of consume all kinds of vegetables and fruits and pulses, legumes. Uh, of course, calcium products, which will come through in milk and other dairy products. So that may help it. But if you're still uh, experiencing a hair fall, uh, you can take uh, biotin supplements through medicines. Uh, not to go away from that point, there are certain diseases also which can have hair fall. We, uh, or we call it as alopecia. There are certain infections of the scalp or any other particular area of the body which can cause hair loss. There are diseases like lupus in which there is hair loss. So if it's only hair fall without anything else, it could be related to your diet, your stress, uh, but uh, if it's uh, particularly bothersome and if there are any other associated symptoms in your body, you need to go to check up with your doctor. You might find some other ailment there. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, well, we have several questions, some very uh, uh, you know, detailed questions from Vijay Patwa, Devendra Gada, Monchi, Isaac. Uh, Joseph Fonseca, I'm really sorry that we are not able to take uh, all these questions. Uh, 
But thank you very much uh, for uh, being here, Dr. Puri, uh, spending all this time and patiently answering all the questions. Uh, and thank you, all of you, for being here. We have uh, 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 had an amazing response today. And um, I know it's a festival day and a holiday in many parts of the country, but thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Puri. We have. Thank uh, you for the imaging. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Mr. Vikram Sethi also for uh, bringing me onto this platform. And uh, it's really uh, wonderful interacting. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, whenever you, any one of you who's been to the seminar is visiting Ludhiana, please do drop in. You're most welcome. Okay, thank you very much. We have uh, another session of Health Live at Seniors Today next week. Uh, so. Uh, next Saturday, so please be there.